Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Firaxis Livestream. I'm Pete Murray, your host, joined today by Anton Stranger, gameplay designer for Sid Meier's Civilization VI Gathering Storm, and senior producer Dennis Shirk, who has been leading the Civ Six charge since the dawn of time. <laughs> Guys, thank you for uh, coming on today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Phoenicia. Yeah, Phoenicia. Yay. So, Dennis, Dido is back. Yes, and first off, I want to say thank you for everybody who's uh, shown up to watch. I know this is press preview day, so there's lots of stuff to read out there. So it's awesome that you stopped by to, uh, to learn all about Dido and Phoenicia. We have the latest build. The latest build. Hot on the yes. edge. Even newer. So <laughs> you're going to see some good stuff today that you actually don't get to see in even the, uh, the press stuff that they don't have. So well, that's cool. So Dido and Phoenicia, we're actually uh, very excited to show off. Uh, we were talking earlier where I referred to her as the, um, I would say, the, the Swiss Army knife of civilizations in terms of what you can do with her, the combinations you can put together to play effectively in almost any situation. And she actually showed up once before in the civilization, but as Carthage in yep. Civilization V. And so she, now she's back properly as Phoenicia in Civ VI. But the cool thing is, is we actually have the same voice actress doing the, the voice do. for both, too. Yeah. We figured we found somebody who can actually speak effectively with that language, so why ruin something good? There not being a huge call for people who speak ancient Canaanite yes. these days, when you find somebody who's good, you go with them. Yep. Just in case you're wondering about finding Canaanite speakers at some point in the future. All right, so let's go ahead and we're going to jump into our game. Uh, driving today, as usual, is Carl, Yay, servitor Carl. of Moloch. Uh, we're going to be playing <laughs> on King difficulty today. Uh, so here we've got her abilities. This is... Um, Phoenicia was the original Thalassa, Thalassa, Thal Thalassa sea power, Roger. right? Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of things here set up for them as a naval power. Yeah, like Dennis was saying, she's kind of a Swiss Army knife in terms of her uh, bonuses, uh, but uh, you kind of have to. It's a little bit tricky to set it up right, and what we'll see in Carl's game is that he's done a lot of really smart, uh, strategic, and sort of geopolitical plays early on to start settling on the coasts, getting a bunch of Cawthons, spreading across multiple continents in order to stack these bonuses later in the game and have just like really lucrative trade routes and global presence on the map. Um, so yeah, her um, founder of Carthage ability lets her move her capital. It's a very unique mechanic in Civ Six that we haven't had. Um, the only other time this would happen is like if you got your original capital conquered, you'd get a secondary capital as a new one. Uh, but what she can do is she can actually move her original capital. Um, so it's really cool uh, if you um, are under a really long siege, you might be able to <laughs> sneak yeah. your original capital out in time. That's not usually viable in multiplayer because uh, the project takes a while. But um, you it can does, totally do it while you're at war, though. You can totally do it while you're at war. You can move your capital to somewhere that has a Cawthon district. Um, it also allows you to use bonuses in some really interesting ways that we'll see in Carl's game. I um, actually prefer moving the capital when you. It, it, in a great situation with her is founding cities on a new shore, little tail issues, lots yeah. of other civilizations, use that opportunity to move your capital because you've yeah. already got established cities, lots of loyalty where you were. Yeah. It's a great way to keep expanding. Yeah, so have a, a beachhead on another continent to yeah. really like open up your new colonies just like Phoenicia did in the ancient Mediterranean. So um, she also gets bonus trade routes from her government plaza district and more production towards um, you know those dis the district and the buildings that go inside it. Um, the Mediterranean colonies, uh, you know, writing technology boost, uh, which represents the sort of like Phoenician alphabet, which is one of the earliest written and widespread sort of languages. It's right. sort of the, you know, Phoenicia wasn't really an empire formally in the same sense that like Rome was. Um, we were talking about this a bit earlier, Pete, but they sort of had a common culture and, you know, language that sort of united them. Yeah, and uh, the Byram, an interesting thing about that is they were they were unquestionably at the time the best builders of boats in the Mediterranean, and they built them for anybody who had money. So the Persians, <laughs> the Greeks, <clears throat> anybody who uh, who had coin, the uh, the Phoenicians would set you up, which is pretty good. Yeah. All right. So here's our save here. Um, Carl has been uh, exploring our opening continent here. Here's the Byram. Uh, this time we have built it for ourselves. It's got a really cool eye on the side of the ship there. Um, and one of the bonuses of these guys is that um, trade routes within, I believe it's four tiles, yes. can't get plundered, can't get pillaged. Um, so it's really nice. You can have sort of like a network of coastal byremes, uh, you know, exploring and protecting your cities, but also um, protecting lucrative naval trade routes. Right. What is that silly round-shaped harbor I see? 
Uh, the Silly Round Shaped Harbor is the Cawthon District. So that's their unique harbor district. Um, it gives uh, bonus production towards settlers and towards naval units. And if you have a naval unit within that city's boundaries, they heal up in one turn, which is really useful. Um, so Carl's done something really smart here where he's set up Tyre as basically the ultimate settler factory. So um, he's got the Cawthon, which is uh, plus 50% uh, production towards settlers. Um, he has Magnus there, which will, uh, when we, and with the pro promotion of provision, so the settlers don't cost population. Um, and I think he's also got a social policy that's helping us out. Um, yes, he's got yeah, the plus 50% yep. production towards settlers. So he's basically just cranking out settlers from Tyre. Um, this is the early expansion phase of Phoenicia, which is really important to getting that um, <coughs> later in the game. Uh, and the ancestral hall he's working on in, um, in that other city there will give us another 50% towards settlers once it, that's complete. This is one of the um, setup things that Anton was mentioning early in the live stream when he's saying Phoenicia, if you get everything set up properly, is going to be so powerful, especially the speed at which Carl can now expand with that Settler Factory. It's all about the layering game mechanics with them. Yeah. So we've got a lot of coastal cities already, um, but Carl's uh, gonna kind of move that Settler up into the mountains because we have, uh, very fittingly, the Ottomans and Rome kind of like are our neighbors. So, um, you know, we've got the Roman capital not too far from us, and, uh, you know, there's Istanbul, not Constantinople. <coughs> um, and so, you know, historically, Phoenicia and Rome were uh, great rivals. Um, it's one of my favorite times of history, actually, with Hannibal and the Punic Wars and stuff. So, um, you know, Rome is uh, so far friendly with us this game, but uh, certainly when I played this save, they were not so friendly later on. So um, we'll see what happens. Uh, right now, they're sending us trade routes, which is great. I noticed that uh, a lot of the Roman territories are colored differently than they normally would be. They are, yeah. So this is part of our uh, Jersey system. Uh, so when uh, so Rome also normally has this sort of purple color by default um, when you play them. Um, but because you know we are a human player and we decided, hey, we're going to play Phoenicia, we sort of like uh, trump that and we say, okay, well we're going to play our player colors and Rome switches to a sort of like alternate visitor jersey of colors color set, um, and it's fitting because uh, one of the things that uh, Phoenicia and their trade was really famous for was this uh, this dye that was really like one of the, the Tyrian purple, Tyrian purple, which yep. is like the the coolest uh, coolest uh, most hip thing to have if you were a noble in the ancient world because it was had this really cool like deep blood purple color. Uh, it was Rome is it, it was like used to dye like the robes of like Roman senators and aristocrats, and yep. uh, it kind of kept its color even after exposure to the sun. And all you had to do was like gather up ten thousand snails and poke them and squish them and. And uh, it was kind of kind of gruesome and not very cost effective. But, but a luxury <laughs> good that everybody wanted and and very effective for them. Yeah. So um, going back to the Jersey system, Ed did say uh, that that's going to be something that's available for multiplayer um, right. as well too. So you can choose if you like um, yeah, when you're playing multiplayer. Lobby, you can like, choose hey, one of the be... yeah the Jersey colors for your for your thing. Yeah. <clears throat> So we got the Cliffs of Dover down there in the tundra, which might make a good city spot, but um, you know it's not going to have super great yields. But it, you know, having another coastal city is not all, not a bad idea. Um, we've got the Nazca city state up there, but I think it's being besieged. Yeah, uh, somebody's somebody's unhappy with it, but yeah. that's okay. I mean, for us, we don't really. I mean, other than possibly pushing a little bit of religion, we don't need their unique improvement necessarily. Right. Uh, so we we can we can maybe let that one go. Yeah. Now for the audio files out there, one of the more interesting stories with this particular set of music, um, it's been playing off and on. You heard it during uh, during some of the warm up. Is Phoenicia's theme was actually created from one of the oldest known cuneiform tablets that was ever discovered. Yep. I think. I, let me. I got to go to my notes, but it's called the uh, the hymn to the moon goddess Nikal. But the cool story behind this is when the when our when our designers decided to create a theme for this, they actually went to this because it was such a great story. This is this is the only known complete piece of music, or I should say the earliest complete piece of music that they were able to actually identify as music. Right. It had lyrics paired with actual music. It wasn't written like the way modern mu music is. They had to actually kind of tear it down, mm -hmm. imagine what everything is there. There's no sense of what the tone actually is, mm. but they can get that there's a certain cadence to it. After discovering um, instruments, actually yeah. digging up instruments made of different like forged sizes of hammers and things like that, they were able to pair the two together and come up with what they think is actual Phoenician music. Um, the people who have 
torn this apart have actually come up with a few different themes for what they think it is. They've got similarities to them, but they're various different pieces. Right. And what, uh, I, Jeff Nor wrote this one, I believe? This is Roland. Roland did this one? Yeah. Um, and what he did with this is he basically said, okay, here's a few different choices that I have, and obviously he chose the prettiest one yeah. to run with it. But I would encourage everybody, if they're curious, to actually look up uh, this piece of music. It's called the Song Tablet. Um, and it's, in, it's interesting, too, because you can't help but use your imagination a little bit. The, the tablet's actually pretty small. When they were actually inscribing it, they'd go right around the side and straight around the back again. Yep. And on the one leading edge, they actually had like a category written. So when they put this away, no paper, so they had stones, it would just be put on this edge, you know, categorized with everything else. And, and there's the, the, book, on the, the book binding, if you will. Hmm. Something like you'd expect your grandfather to tell you about, you know, when I was your age, we didn't have paper. We had to write the We wrote the, the title of the books on our cuneiform tablets. <laughs> but pretty funny. look that up. It's great. It's a, it's a really interesting um, piece to read about and also just uh, for the possibility of actually listening to the other pieces as they as they were interpreted. I remember, so like during development, we um, often do these things called sprint reviews where um, every month or so, like we sort of like have a, you know, a couple weeks worth of, you know, work like design, art, audio, engineering. We all get together and we kind of show off what we've done to the rest of the team and get on the same page. And like, so that's when, you know, we got to hear like uh, Roland get up to the stage and say like, hey, like there's these um, different variations of this ancient Phoenician music and here's the research we've done and like here are the different variations. This is the one we chose and this is why. And so hearing stuff like that's really cool. Yeah. And just having that collaborative process throughout development is really fun. And this was one of the first civilizations that got fully implemented during development, which I yeah. remember um, the message went around to the whole team. Okay, everybody, uh, Phoenicia's checked in. You know, we've got a bunch of new rules. They're the first fully finished sieve. Yeah. They were a little different than they are now, though. Yeah, they actually went through a lot of design variations. So the um, the moving of the capital district or moving of the capital project got changed a couple times. Uh, at first, it was um, <clears throat> basically when you built your government plaza district, uh, you would be able it would automatically move uh, your original capital to that city. Um, so you could only do it once because you can only have one government plaza. Right. Um, but we realized that like, it wasn't very powerful and it sort of was a disincentive to build the government plaza because you're like, well, I don't want to build it yet because maybe I'll want to move my capital later. Right. Um, so we decided to end up like, okay, let's tie it to a repeatable project on the Cotham, the, the unique district, and let you do it as many times as you want, but it's kind of expensive, so you can't just do it at the drop of a hat. Um, another thing that changed a bit was the, um, the loyalty. So uh, it originally was that any coastal city would be 100% loyal all the time. Yeah, that was crazy. And it was it was crazy pretty awesome. nuts. It was crazy awesome. Little, little yeah. So yeah, and like on some maps, I was like, okay, yeah, this is fine. But on other maps, you know, like Inland Sea, which is very fitting for me, Phoenicia is just like, oh, I just like, I own the coastlands and it's never a problem for me. So we, we switched it to be this, okay, well, coastal cities, but only the ones on your own continent. And having that in combination with being able to move your capital to change what your home continent is, um, allows you to be really flexible. We'll see that in Carl's later save, kind of how he takes advantage of that. Um, but now, for now, like our capital of Tyre uh, is, you know, on this continent, and we all of our coastal cities are totally locked in. So we've got some barbarian problems in this, in our city, our desert city here. It would be nice. That'd be a nice Nazca line city, but uh, <laughs> that ship may have sailed. Petra becomes a Petra city. It could be a Petra city. Yeah. Speaking of wonders... Not the best I've seen, but yeah, Carl is working on it. Yeah, so we could do that. Speaking of wonders, this is a sieve that you want the Venetian arsenal Oh, for. yeah. Like, Definitely. for sure. <laughs> yeah, when it comes yeah. up, yeah. Yeah, if you get Venetian arsenal and that 50% bonus production towards uh, naval units from the Cawthon, it's it's pretty insane, so... He just upgraded with the... Uh, looks like he's constructing the lighthouse down there, and he actually saw the whole model update, too, which is yep. a nice look. Yeah, I love the way that, and we'll see it later, but the way that the district looks once all, it has all of its buildings in it. Yeah. Um, it looks very unique. It's got that circular shape. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely one of the easiest ones to identify. Uh, even in the fog of war, it's it's easiest to come across, so. Mm -hmm. Horses for iron. Yeah, don't give the Romans iron. That's... Just, that <laughs> seems like a, a reasonable reasonable idea. So um, there's a lot you can do early in the game with Phoenicia, but it's, it mostly involves like not a specific gameplay approach. It's more about using their abilities to, to seize territory early on with the idea that you're going to expand into it later. And um, yeah. when we switch to our second save in a few minutes, uh, you'll be able to see 
specifically all the space <clears throat> and and how Carl was able to use a lot of really clever tactics to, to kind of get Phoenicia across the world. Um, I think they're particularly well suited for domination victory. I, I feel like um, there's, I have a save going with them right now where I'm pushing for domination and having pushed back some of my enemies pretty well, like there's no question I'm gonna control the seas. It's just a matter of time before I start picking off those last few land capitals. Yeah. I think, yeah, at, like they're pretty, they do have that sort of um, Swiss army knife, Phoenician army knife approach where you can kind of lean in a lot of different directions. Domination is definitely um, a good one. And especially if you kind of, you know, end up having a presence on all sorts of different coastal, t uh, right. you know, continents all across the world, then, you know, your army can sort of like get to the doorstep of the of your opponents much more easily. And, right. you know, having control of the seas can help you facilitate that. Um you know, having a bunch of, uh, you know, strong, uh, wide empire play, plus a lot of really good trade routes, uh, you know, can kind of set you up on just a good economic footing to kind of lean in whatever direction you want later on. I'm trying to imagine what a Phoenician army life would actually look like in real life. It looks like a regular one, but it's made out of stone. Ah, okay. there you go. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, the one, the it's one very thing. Hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there are no vowels. That's the other thing. Um, <laughs> The, the one thing, I it, because um, certainly Sweden is so strong at, at the diplomatic game and Canada is so strong at the diplomatic game, I, f I feel like in contrast, these guys are maybe not quite so set up for that. Yeah. But I mean, I guess theoretically speaking, if you're maintaining your suzerainty on people and you've got, you know, a, a good set of alliances going, there's no reason you couldn't be a contender for it. Yeah, there's nothing that's specifically helping you as Phoenicia, but right. yeah, like, if you do play a more diplomatic play style, you go for those alliances, go for those city-states, and, you know, rack up a bunch of favor, um, then that could be good. One thing that's really good, too, is, like, if you have, um, uh, if later on, if other players are getting hit by, for example, natural disasters, and they're asking for aid requests, right? Um, one of the ways you can score up in those competitions is to send them gold. And again, like as Phoenicia, you can have a lot of gold um, if you have those trade routes going. So being able to kind of channel the, the gold into a diplomatic victory point or two here and there might give you that edge to win that victory type later. Mm -hmm. Well, so, as we churn towards our golden age here, maybe we should... Uh... I want to give it maybe a couple you want more to give turns. It a couple more turns. Yeah, okay. Rome looks like they're up to something. <laughs> I saw that Rome. too. They peeked some they, guys out of the fog. And yeah, they they kind of like looked, poked poked a legion out and tried to see what was going on. So oh, it'd I be funny that. if they did uh, declare war on Carl here. We wouldn't have to play out the war, but I would. I kind of do want to see if it happens. That's a nice spot for a city. Holy cow. Nice natural canal city. Yeah. So there's a bunch of new historic moments going on here. Uh, that one was. Um, um, basically, if you build a tile improvement on a uh, tile that got extra yield from a natural disaster, so there might have been a flood there <laughs> earlier, or like a storm Maybe or something storm like that, swept it. Um, yeah. And so going in and building a tile improvement, it's like, hey, you're you're taking advantage of this uh, land that you know got wrecked, but is now more uh, more fertile. So, um, so holding off the barbarians, no problem. So uh, people have been watching um, the the labels as they've come up over the uh, the map. And um, a lot of the rivers and the mountains that are in there are named after ones in the real world. Yeah. So I know uh, Matt Beach went through and, and came up with gigantic lists. Yeah. Um, and for you guys who are modders, those are just text files. You'll be able to append for sure. things to that. Um, although I'd be surprised if you missed anything particularly. Yeah, I think we were pretty thorough, but yeah. Um, and, and, and they are kind of like geographically linked as well. So if you're playing as Phoenicia, you're going to see more sort of um, names that are associated with Phoenician areas in the real world. Correct. And stuff like that, like names yep. of mountains and rivers and stuff like that. So um, somebody asked, what happens when the seas rise with Phoenicia? Well, uh, it could be a bad time. It depends. So when, you, when you're when <coughs> you settling a city, yep. um, you do get a lot of information about what are the potential natural disasters or, you know, man-made disasters that could happen here. So you will see uh, when you're settling, there's a little wave icon. It's like, yeah. and there's a, either a one, a two, or a three. Right. And so as the sea levels rise in your game, uh, you know, first the ones get hit, then the twos get hit, and then the threes get hit. And first they get flooded and then they get submerged. So while you're settling, uh, you know, a coastal city, you know, you could you could see that ahead of time. We, we didn't want players right. to have to do guesswork on that. Um, so you, you will know, like, even though it's not really scientifically realistic for Phoenicia to know this in the ancient era, 
There's a there's a flood that's going that's on there. That's a pretty good flood. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Um, but you'll know like okay later in the game this is a potential danger flooding site. So you can choose you can you can still have a lot of coastal city options and right. decide to opt out of that risk, or you could decide hey I'm going to settle there anyway and I'll just you know have a flood barrier, have a <clears throat> coastal sea barrier um, to build to kind of like keep that at bay if it does happen. That's something you can kind of keep an eye on. You watch the CO2 right. panel, see how everybody else is playing the game. Yeah. If you see some aggressive CO2 levels rising that's kind of out of your control, then you might want to beeline for flood barriers just to be prepared. Yeah. Is Rome doing anything to us? Oh, here they come. Okay, yeah, Rome's sending something towards us. And they also took Nazca city-state, and uh, they don't have a lot of loyalty there. Oh, there yeah, it is. Oh, it is. there it goes. Yeah, starting next to Rome, you kind of expect this two, three times. Uh, they can't help themselves. Yeah, it's true. At least early in the game, before you get to make friends. So basically, loading up the later save is just going to be a big Rome game at that point, right? Well, <laughs> Carthage must fall. Yeah, Carthago Delinda Est or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Carthago Delinda Est. All right. Yeah. Well, on that note, shall we uh, shall we jump yeah. into the future and see how things go? Sure. Yeah, let's so hop we'll into our, our time machine. Yeah, we'll bring and, uh... our Phoenician music <laughs> down. And um, this is a good opportunity to talk about something that's going to be new for Civ Six. Yeah, we'll do a we'll do a drive by feature preview here as Carl is uh, stopping through the main menu and um, take a look at a new multiplayer mode called Play by Cloud. It's in the cloud. But we're gonna have to wait for Carl because. Carl prematurely loaded the second save. So, <coughs> so we'll give it a second. <laughs> real, real quick, what is Play by Cloud? Well, play, we had a previous multiplayer mode, which was Play by Email. Yeah. It was a little bit more of a manual process. It was a little awkward, and we wanted to have a more integrated thing where we're not actually uh, passing saves around. So we implemented a mode called Play by Cloud. So when you set it up, you can invite your friends. It sends a join code out. It's storing everything up on our servers, so the game is maintained no matter whose turn it is. Um, and it notifies you when it's your turn. So it'll notify you uh, through in-game. It'll notify you um, through uh, through the if you've got the Steam app on your phone. Yep. Yeah, it uses this sort of webhook thing. Yeah. So you can kind of choose in the game options like, hey, I want to, you know, I want to uh, be notified this way or that way or whatever. And you can set up your own webhooks as well. You don't have to use just the Steam notifications. So those are all a thing. So we'll switch over to the screen here, and Carl will just kind of jump over to the um, Play by Cloud screen. Not the whole way but just to show you in the options. So normally, if he was actually logged in online, um, you'd have another option, it's just sitting there, and it just sets up like any other multiplayer game, yeah. and has a join code, and you copy the join code out, send it to all your friends, off you go. Now, this is <clears throat> this is for somebody who likes a long game of Civilization, a oh, very, yeah. very, very long game. So if you don't have the time to devote to a regular multiplayer session, and you were like, you know what, I've only got five minutes before I go to work, log yeah. in, take your turn, fire and forget, it takes care of notifying yeah. the next person. Mm -hmm. So it's very yeah. much like uh, like uh, there are some some folks here in the office that do uh, chess matches online, yeah. and so they they might have like four or five different chess games going on at once with different friends and stuff. But they just log in, you know, take a turn once per day, you know, have three or four different games going, yeah. and then uh, you know go about the rest of their day and hop back in. Or you know, if you want to, you know, mainline it for a couple hours, you can do that too. Yep. So yeah, so it's quite fun. All right, so Carl's going to load us up here as we go into our future stream. Yeah, I remember when Play by Cloud used to be past the floppy around. Yes, back that in was, the day. Yeah. For those of you who don't know what a floppy disk is... <laughs> it's it looks, the icon where, that the save is... Yeah, when you your save, save thing, icon, it was a physical object yeah, it's that like, you used to... It's the whole thing. Go ask your dad. He can tell you about it. <laughs> so... Uh, um, couple of other questions uh, people have had through here. How do you know when it's time to recommission a nuclear power plant? It's a good question. We'll That's touch a little question. bit on the power system today, but uh, yeah. So there, are, to back up a little bit, there are three different types of power plants. The nuclear power plant is by far the most efficient; it's the most technologically advanced, but comes with this risk of nuclear fallout. Um, so there is a project to recommission the nuclear reactor. Um, in your production list. And on the tooltip for that project, I believe, is where it says, you know, like, this is the age of the reactor. And the longer uh, you go it w with that reactor without recommissioning it, the higher the chance gets uh, for it, for something to go wrong. Uh, so there's some descriptive details in when you're on the production for the city, choosing what to make next. It'll 
clue you in to like, oh, okay, like this is how long I, you know, maybe I can risk it and not do it this time. Uh, maybe I should go ahead and recommission it now. So that's where that information lives. Very cool. Okay. All right, so here we are. It is the future. Um, as we can see, Phoenicia is now a big purple blob that's spread out all over the world's that coastlines. Tyrian purple blob, yes. Tyrian it purple looks like blob. he does have flood barriers as well, so yeah. he actually <laughs> thought ahead to that. And he, that's our, uh, uh, our glorious capital of Gadir up in the north there. Tyre is no longer our capital because we yeah, moved it. Yeah, because he's moved it a couple of times. This is, uh, this is pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, to kind of give a brief geopolitical history here. So what Carl did was we, we had the Tyre capital from earlier in the game. You know, we successfully held off Rome and all that sort of stuff. We, we settled quite well here. And then we went over to this other continent over to the east. And we set up our second capital of Carthage. <laughs> uh, we built a Carthon and we moved it over there. And so with that foothold, uh, it helps that we also had a bunch of city-states nearby which don't have a lot of loyalty pressure. Uh, we set up a foothold, you know, had locked loyalty, all that stuff. We <coughs> snuck in on the other coast of that continent as well with these cities. Yep. Um, and so even though our capital is no longer on this continent, uh, Carl built the Statue of Liberty, which has a very similar effect. It's just in a local range. Historically um, accurate, too. Yep. Totally historically accurate. Uh, yep. So uh, it will... Um, so. For those of you who can't read the description behind our picture in picture there, what the Statue of Liberty does is within six there tiles, thank you, uh, within six tiles, it basically locks you at full loyalty. Um, so our city there, as well as the one to the north, is at full loyalty, even though it's surrounded by, you know, a lot of, uh, looks like Swedish cities there. And the um, Swedes probably aren't real happy with us for settling up the coast quite, quite as hard as we did. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll touch, touch base on one other new thing while we've got here. We've got, we've got a lot of cities spread across the map. We've got a lot of civilizations. Yeah. But we do want to point out one other report that I think will make a lot of people happy. Um, everybody knows the joys in Civ of clicking on everybody's leader and then going into the deal table to see if they actually have what they want to do trade you for. Spices? Do you have spices? Right. Do you have, who's got iron? Does so, anybody have iron? We've been working on a new, uh, a new report that we can put in, and we'll have Carl navigate over to the resource report. So... Gloriously, now you'll be able to see uh, the basic resources that everybody has, just just for things that are exposed on the deal table already. And then if you see something you need, you just click on them, go right into the, the trade menu then, and have your trade away. But I think this will be a, a popular addition that a lot of people have been asking for. Especially with the accumulating strategic resources now, you can kind of see at a glance, like, yeah. ooh, Rome's got a lot of iron, I better watch out, yeah. like that. Or, hey, Rome's got a lot of iron, let me make a trade with them because we're friends. Right. Yep. It's when Rome suddenly stops having a lot of iron that you have to... Where did it go? Where did it go? <laughs> yeah, definitely helps with late game uh, late game management, though. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we um, so Carl has brought us back to um, so so the third capital that Carl settled is up uh, towards the north, and uh, if you open up the continent lands, um, it is actually on a different continent now. Yes. Um, so because of that, so so our our cities up on the coast there have full one hundred percent loyalty um, with our Carthage with our uh, Phoenicia bonus. Um, but something else that's really clever that Carl's done, which is a really neat um, Phoenician strategy, is that there are a lot of bonuses in the game that are uh, keyed off of uh, cities that are not on your home continent. And so what he's done by moving his capital to a fairly remote continent that he doesn't have a lot of cities on is he um, has social policies like the colonial offices and colonial taxes, uh, which are giving a whole bunch of economic bonuses to our uh, like non-home continent colony cities, right. which are actually kind of like our core powerful cities from earlier in the game. Um, and I think he also has the Casa de Contracion Wonder, which is uh, stacking some bonuses there as well. Yep. So, uh, so he's basically you know set up a really powerful empire, moved his capital out into kind of into the hinterlands, uh, but by doing so, has beefed up the rest of his empire. Um, so that's a really cool combination that he's got going on. And there, you can um, see some cool stuff too. You can see the modern Cothan. You yeah. can see the flood barriers that are set up around the, the low yeah. tiles. You can There's see the, the Golden Gate Bridge. He has an Very excellent good. spot for the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, that's a really cool bay that he's, <laughs> that's the, the San Francisco Bay, but <clears throat> uh, Phoenician version. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so he's got a really good empire going here. Um, and he's got a lot of alliances as well. So, you know, time has passed. Uh, Trajan and us, were cool now. Uh, so we got an economic alliance and things are good. Um, you know, he's got a very strong economy. You know, you look at the 1,700 gold per turn from all these crazy trade routes. He's got 27 trade routes going. Um, as I believe I mentioned in one of the previous streams, uh, one of the changes we made to trade routes in Gathering Storm is that if they go over uh, things that help them, uh, that 
in the fiction of the game, travel faster. So going over ocean, going over the Golden Gate Bridge, going over canal districts, going over mountain tunnels or railroads, um, they get this sort of transportation gold bonus. So international trade routes get up to almost double the gold that they would normally get. So by having this multi-continent empire and having a bunch of trade routes from our Phoenicia bonuses, we're able to get a bunch of gold per turn. Um, and, you know, if it's set up like this, can even outcompete Mali uh, and their powerful trade route bonuses. He had to work a little harder than the Mali to get there, yeah. but it's another one of those things, if you spend time with Phoenicia, you're gonna unlock an incredible amount of power by really digging deep into their mechanics and, and really layering all the different options that you have available to you. Yeah. All right, so we are going to take a look at some of the different options you have available for you for these uh, these new governments. Yeah. So we've added an entire new government system, uh, the, these tier four governments. Yeah, so um, Carl is on the cusp of the tier four governments, the most powerful governments in the game, and here they are. So we have synthetic technocracy, we have corporate libertarianism, and digital democracy. And these are sort of like a combination of, you know, touchstones in history and current events that we see like, oh, this could be an interesting direction for government, you know, political science to evolve in, plus some cool science fiction elements. So um, each of them uh, has nine policy card slots and five of those and each of them are wild card. Uh, so that's really significant. That gives you a lot more flexibility uh, because, you know, your, your legacy cards from previous governments are, have to be in a wild card slot. Once you get further into the future era of the civics tree, there are really powerful social policies that help you um, either go for a certain victory or push down someone else going for a certain victory. Those are also wildcard policy slots. So this basically is, is your setup for your run to whatever victory you want. Um, and the, the way that they're different is that they have a particular inbuilt strength towards one victory type and weakness for another victory type. So synthetic technocracy, for example, uh, you get three power for free in all of your cities and 30% production towards all city projects. And as I'll explain a little bit later, that sets you up really well for the new science victory. Uh, but uh, you get minus 10% tourism, so you're not as good at the culture victory. Um, so while our AI overlords may make it really good at keeping the lights on, nobody wants to visit them because it's creepy to have targeted ads shown up at you all the time. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so uh, the designers and, and Pete as well as our writer had a lot of fun dreaming up kind of what these governments would mean. So do you want to go into like a bit about like what synthetic technocracy kind of means for you? Sure, um, and actually somebody had asked a question earlier about where, where do we get some of the ideas for things like quotes and, uh, and you know, the text and civics in it. And in this case, we were kind of like projecting ahead yeah. and going, you know, based on what we see now in the world, what, what could the future potentially hold? So. Synthetic technocracy, a technocracy is a government by specialists. A synthetic technocracy would be one where potentially an AI would be involved with that uh, too. Um, corporate libertarianism is, is uh, generally this idea that, um, you know, economic entities, whether Super they be seed. people yeah. or corporations are kind of the basis of the governance for it. And a digital democracy is something that's like um, upvote for president. No, uh, it's <laughs> where you have a much more uh, direct system of government where, where people are yeah. instead of going through mediated bodies there's a lot of kind of like quick polling of, yeah. of the populace and it kind of goes like back that. to like a very early like i think even plato talked about like a, like a very direct democracy where you know yeah where whereas a lot of um you know bigger nations today have more representative democracies it's like okay well you know like let's vote for a congressman and then a congressman will vote for this thing. Uh, the idea of a direct democracy or digital democracy if it was enabled by technology yeah. is like, okay, yeah, like here's this law. And assuming everybody was educated enough to make a guess, it's like, okay, like yes or no or whatever. And like, it's just all very seamless and there's no problems with it at all. And because this is Civ, when you do it, it's totally utopian. And when your enemies do it, it's totally dystopian. Yeah. So yeah, so we'll just, we'll leave it with that for the, for the time being. Yeah. Um, so then Carl's going for uh, optimization imperative, which will give us the, oh, you're going for corporate libertarianism. Or, um, yeah, there, there are a couple different ones. Um, so yeah. Yeah, Carl is going, so as, as we mentioned earlier, Phoenicia is well set up, especially with the way that Carl's done this, to have a very strong economy. Um, and he's going for a science victory, which the synthetic technocracy will help us with. And we are one turn away from our first step in it. And when we do that, we'll take a, we'll take a look at how the science victory has changed as well, too. Yeah, sounds good. I like there's one Ottoman bombard. <laughs> what is he Ottoman. doing there? <laughs> it's a goodwill tour. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. He's moving. What is it? What is it doing? <laughs> it's just driving around, man. Yeah. Driving around. 
need service. We have service. mechanized infantry. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> the garage is the whole way over in like Rayana or something. In yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. Got a bad wheel. Maybe, maybe he's going for for Molly over there, and he's just going through some open borders. He's, yeah, he's got a, a grudge. <laughs> All right, here we go. So there's our Earth sound. So the science victory. So we knew with Gathering Storm that we wanted to add a future era to the game. Right. Extend the game a little bit, have some really cool kind of science fiction technologies and governments, as we just said. Uh, and we wanted to revisit the victories as well. Um, so with the culture victory, you know, we have the rock band. With the domination victory, we have the giant death robot. And with the science victory, it sort of extends out and goes further into the future of what that would actually mean. So um, as before, you're going to launch an Earth satellite and land on the moon. But um, the third step is now this sort of combined, uh, from, net, from the nanotechnology um, tech, you establish a Martian colony. Um, so in the base game and in Rise and Fall, there were three parts to this. There's yes. the hydroponics, the reactor, um, the three different things, uh, and you'd have to launch them all separately. It was pretty expensive production-wise. Now we've kind of collapsed those into basically just one project, es establish a Martian colony. Um, once you've done that, you keep going into the future era and what you do as the final capstone is what's called an exoplanet expedition. Right. Um, you go beyond Earth, if you will, um, to find a <laughs> See what you did there. planet out in the, out in the stars, uh, you know, a nearby star system like Alpha Centauri or something like that. And you find a set, you you know you found a habitable planet, and you send it there, and it travels at one light year per turn. Um, so this is kind of a throwback to actually the science fiction as it was in older Civilization games, like Civilization 1, where you launched a spaceship and it took time to arrive, and once it arrived, you won. Uh, but we've, what we've done instead is, like, it's not a done deal once you launch the spaceship. Uh, you can launch it, it's great, you know, uh, but on standard game speed, you know, you need to travel 50 light years uh, in order to reach the exoplanet. Uh, one, one light year per turn, you know, it's, it's going the speed of light, which, yeah, is fast, but, you know, it could be faster. So you use your other science fiction inventions to speed it along and get you that victory faster. Um, so there are a couple different ways to do that. Uh, one of the coolest is you can help build the International Space Station with the World Congress. And that is a that is a project that you do through yes. the world? Yeah, Congress. so much like we have the World's Fair going on right now, uh, we could decide to use our favor and vote to say like, hey, let's build the International Space Station. And whoever um, trains astronauts with, uh, with their project and kind of contributes the most points to that, whoever wins, gets uh, three extra light years per turn faster. So yes. it's, you know, if you just had the exoplanet expedition, it quadrupled the speed of it. So it'll help you win much faster. Now it only does that if you've actually launched it. So if you like win it, but you don't have your expedition out there yet, it, it won't be active until you do. Right. But you know, it's a really strong accelerator towards that victory. Um, the other two options you have are sort of what the synthetic technocracy kind of plays into. So. Uh, the idea behind the exoplanet expedition is you have this spaceship and it sort of has this solar sail, you know, like it, it's traveling the speed of light um, and it has a certain, you know, velocity of its own, but it doesn't have infinite fuel or anything like that. So what you can do, um, there's actually like a science fiction book that I read that sort of inspired this. Um, you can have lasers, giant lasers, you know, situated yeah. on, on the planet to kind of uh, shoot at the... Um, Exoplanet spaceship, not to blow it up, but to speed it but up. But to, to gently on just the kinda, sail to move kinda, along. Yeah. Go faster. Um, not so of their fear of lasers. No, no. Lasers are lasers, lasers are Lasers are friends. Lasers are our friends. Yeah. So there are two different lasers you can build, and they're both city projects. The first one is called a terrestrial laser. So that's basically you put a laser kind of like on the ground and you and you shoot it. Um, in order to in order to accomplish that, you need a lot of power in your cities. Right. Uh, so you need to have either like really good power plants or a lot of renewable energy. Um, the second option is okay. Well, let's launch a um, a laser sort of space station at a Lagrange point in Earth's orbit, and that has some solar panels. You know, it's built in. It has its own power and it shoots from space. But you need to build the thing and get it up there. So it costs thirty aluminum to get up there, which is so a lot of aluminum. It's quite a bit. So you have this trade-off of like, okay, well, I, I, if you're going for a science victory, you know, you could. Uh, you could wait it out if nobody's competing for you in the late game and just wait the 50 turns on standard speed. That's usually not going to be enough. Um, or you could say, hey, I'm strong in diplomacy. Let me get the International Space Station. Or you could say, like, hey, I got a lot of strategic resources. Let me build the, um, the orbital space lasers. Or I could say, hey, I got a lot of power, a lot of power plants. You know, 
um, got a lot of oil and I don't care about the climate or whatever, if you're a meanie head, and just, uh, you know, build terrestrial lasers and power it that way. So right. those are the ways to kind of like accelerate you towards the end of the game um, to win the, the new science victory. Very cool. And uh, just real quick, after the Sydney Opera House finishes here, we'll just get Carl to bring up the, uh, the, the progress tracker so you can see how that's going to be laid out now. Right on. Oop. We got our optimization imperative complete as well. <clears throat> Very good. So, so we're in the lead on science. Science. Here. We can see, yep, we are moving along. Yep. Cool. So we're launching our moon landing. And yeah, once you uh, once you launch the expedition, you'll be able to see like how many light years do I have left, how many am I getting per turn, that sort of thing. So you yep. couldn't get into a tense situation where it's like, oh, we two different players have expeditions on their way and it's all about who can fire who can, more lasers. Yeah, finish it off faster. Yeah. I see what he did there. He called it Carl Finch. Uh, uh, Carl Finch. Okay. So nice. <laughs> speaking of, after Carl chooses a tech, uh, he's going to go for Seastead, so potentially build the Seastead yeah. improvement. Which so this is one of our first victory, um, or not victory, uh, future era technologies. So going to let us build the Seastead improvement out on the water, which gives us more housing. It's a nice use for those sea tiles. Yep. And it gives us just an automatic diplomatic victory point. But is it good for Bitcoin? Um, I don't know okay. it's good for Bitcoin, yeah. So, uh, there, speaking of diplomacy, there are two uh, diplomatic instances going on right now, which are fairly interesting. Uh, right. So we've got World's Fair, which is getting ready to, to finish up. So we'll drop our picture in picture away so you can see the, the full piece there. So at the at the gold tier, um, can we get the picture in picture gone? Thank there you. we go. Yeah, cool. All right, so... Uh, you know, whoever has the whoever comes in the highest place gets um, a bunch of great people points for free, which is great. Um, and then silver tier, we get a diplomatic favor, and then some less cool stuff if you're down at the bottom. Uh, some civ yeah, civic, yeah, boost. civic boost, yeah. Uh, so another advantage of Carl going really wide here and having a really strong economy is that he is just rolling on the great people points. Uh, he has a bunch of different buildings and a bunch of different districts all across the map. So the competition here is for, you know, much like the historical World's Fair, it's like getting a bunch of smart minds together and seeing all these cool inventions and kind of like seeing who wins awards and stuff like that. So Carl's scientists and inventors are clearly in the lead here, so it'll probably work out well for us. Now, the other one is kind of interesting because it is an emergency. Uh, yes. It's an aid request it's um, kind that of, we are the target of. Yeah, so I mentioned this earlier. So um, in this case, you know, we had like a natural disaster or something that happened to us, and we said, hey, like, world, we need help. Uh, you know, we had a flood or something like that, so um, come to us and give us gold or, you know, complete these aid projects for us. So it's kind of like a nice economic boost for us, um, the, the story being like, help us rebuild after this natural disaster happened. Yep. Um, the bonus for other players who are involved, right now it looks like Suleiman <laughs> is the uh, leader, is that they get a diplomatic victory point. So we have to be careful, you know, like if, if someone else is on the cusp of a diplomatic victory, we don't want to Yeah, you don't want to hand, hand them, them the, yeah. But in this case, it's like, yeah, cool, you like, you know, it'll be fine. And, uh, you know, there's diplomatic favor that they can get from it as well. So this whole time, Carl's standing next to his vault trying to keep the door closed while the gold's spilling out while holding on his hand. <laughs> yeah, to we, hey guys, go borrow some we're money. So, we're really, we're yeah, really having really trouble here. Because here <laughs> I got 27 trade routes and 1,700 gold a turn. Yeah. Is there an easy way to track power? There is, yeah. So, yeah, this might be a good time to talk about the power system. <coughs> so, um, on the city banners here, here's an example of a city that is not doing so well on the power. Um, so as I mentioned in a previous stream, but um, power is basically a way to supercharge your more advanced buildings later in the game. So it's not anything that's going to punish you necessarily if you don't have enough of it. No. Uh, so uh, if we open up our, uh, if we click on that guy right there, what we see is there's the power panel. Um, and here we kind of get a readout of what all this means. So uh, this city, because it has a research lab, requires three power. So the research lab, like if we hop on over um, to the buildings tab, like the research lab has a different effect. Um, so like uh, down on the research lab, we see, okay, it gives us three science, but it gives us another five if the city's powered. Right. So this is kind of like how a lot of the late game buildings are now, where they have a baseline bonus that's okay, um, but it will be much better if, as long as we can keep that power going. So back on the um, city power panel, um, like we'll see, okay, we need three power for this city to be fully powered. Uh, and we don't have any right now. Um, so any of the buildings, like the research lab, that require power are temporarily less effective. So it's not really a penalty, but it's sort of like a missed opportunity. Um, and the, the little advisor there is telling us, okay, well, we can build a power plant nearby um, to you know, use resources to help us meet that need. We can build uh, the dam and put a hydroelectric dam on that. 
Um, we can build some renewable green energy, um, and you know, with the future tech, we're getting more and more of those. So we have um, a builder ready to go here to build a solar panel to help us um, help us, you know, with that need. I think the solar panel will give us two power, so it won't be quite enough to meet the power need, but it's well on our way, and we can make another one next turn. And it'll give us some gold and some production as well, too. Yeah, yeah. So they're not they're not bad improvements to have. They give you a little bit of a bonus. Uh, but it's not as good, going to be as good as something like a mine. But on a tundra tile, yeah, it's a, it's great, especially if the city needs power. Um, if there's a city that like has enough power, we might also. Oh yeah, we're working on Edmondson Scott there as well um, for that wonder bonus. Um, is there a city that has adequate? Like so, yeah, like Enyuk over there. Like we might be able to see kind of what the power panel looks like um, for a city that has enough power. So. So here's a good example. So um, we have a research lab and a broadcast center here. Both of them require three power, but in this case, we're meeting it. So what's happening is Tyre uh, has an oil power plant, and it's uh, using that oil to generate power and sending it to our city of Ainuk. Um, so it's meeting that need of six. Right. Um, so this is where the sort of like the, the advantage comes from power plants. It uses resources. It contributes CO2 to the global climate. But um, you're able to get these regional effects for power, and it's very sort of efficient, where, whereas the solar panels and stuff, you need to uh, kind of go and build, and they take up tiles. And they're not a, most of them aren't available until later in the game. Much later. I mean, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they're... Hydroelectric Dam is early on. That's probably the earliest one. But yeah, um, solar panel, wind farm, or later. Offshore wind farm is in the future era. And that's quite nice because it's out in the uh, in the ocean. And uh, there's our hydroelectric dam uh, that Carl has built there. So that's giving some power, I think, probably to Biblos, yeah. Um, so or probably tire, tire as well too. So yeah. So so yeah, that's kind of a uh, brief. Do you want to answer some powers? random questions that have come through from chat? There's uh, somebody that. who's been asking very uh, very nicely um, if the changes to England are going to apply to rise and fall and. Base Civilization Six as well. Uh, so they are not because uh, part of England's new uh, Workshop of the World ability is related to the power system, okay. and the power system is only in Gathering Storm. Okay. Um, as the game advances and CO two increases, do you see ice disappear from that? Yes, you, you can do. see the polar ice start to disappear, which is sort of an interesting way to uh, yeah. get access to the north of it. And that's been balanced interestingly too. We actually are adding more ice than we typically wouldn't have because we wanted to start blocking off some of those passages early in the game that were typically balanced to kind of let you go through because we want that to be a gameplay effect. We want that yeah. to be a thing where, do you want that ice to disappear? Do you want those passages open? Do you want to really pay attention to, to the rising sea levels or not? So there's, like everything else yeah. in this particular expansion, there's going to be pros and cons to everything that's happening in the game. Real quick aside, uh, so Carl's just um, finished up our synthetic technocracy adoption, and um, with the five wildcard policy slots, he's able to slot in, you know, if he wants to, basically all of our legacy wildcard slots, which is really cool. That is pretty cool. Somebody wanted to know how Carl got 27 trade routes <laughs> in the course of the game. Um, I think it's, so part of it is from the Cothons. You know, he's got yeah. so many coastal cities and he's building, you know, uh, the buildings in the, in the Cothons. So that's part of it. Another part of it is from Phoenicia's bonus um, because every, uh, I believe the government plaza at base as well as every building that you put in it, so up to four, right. yeah. uh, will give you another trade route. So that's <clears> another four. So I think it's mostly that. And I think Carl has, what, like 21 cities in this save? So um, there's quite a lot of Cothons. Which is why he was using the production manager rather than going into individual cities. Right, oh, he's and got the Colossus, Colossus as well. Yeah. So yeah, he's he's really been stacking the trade route bonuses. Um, and he got a great person, probably a great merchant earlier, that gave him another capacity as well. Uh, somebody's All asking the, if there will be new victory or defeat movies. There is a new victory movie for the diplomatic victory. There is. So that is, yeah, you'll want to you'll want to get that so you get yeah. to see what that's. So um, that, in a nutshell, is your very flexible, uh, very useful Phoenicia. Um, cool sieve, uh, interesting historically, uh, interesting to see them brought into the future. Uh, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be fun to do. So um, thank you very much for tuning into our live stream this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate you guys uh, checking this out. We've got um, lots of people putting up content today uh, about Civilization VI Gathering Storm. Make sure you check that out as well, too. And we're coming out on February 14th, just about two weeks away. So very exciting. But we appreciate you coming and watching our stream today. Keep tuned to Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, 
MySpace, all the, all the other places that we have uh, civilization presence. And uh, we'll see you for our next civilization live stream. Have a great day.